The platypus is one of nature's strangest animals. It has a bill like a duck and a body like an otter. But arguably, one of its strangest features is that it is one of only a handful of mammals left in the world that lay eggs. These egg-laying mammals were once much more common in the world, but now nearly all of them have gone extinct. So platypus can be seen as a relic from another time period. And in fact, early naturalists used to think the platypus were inferior to the other types of mammals, and were just waiting to go extinct, although this is now known not to be true. But where did the platypus come from if it is so unlike any other living mammal, and how did it survive into the present day if nearly all of its egg-laying relatives have gone extinct? The platypus owes its uniqueness to its placement in the mammalian family tree. The platypus and five species of echidna are the sole living members of a group of mammals known as monotremes. Monotremes are the survivors of a very early branching in the mammal family tree that may have occurred as long ago as the late Triassic, about 200 million years ago. This is why monotremes have so many almost reptilian features, like walking with a sprawling posture, and of course, being able to lay eggs. They have just retained many features from the primitive mammals that lived millions of years ago, at the time of their separation from other mammals. Because of this, they can be seen almost like a transition between reptile-like animals and mammals. For instance, their eggs are actually very small and only contain a small amount of yolk, as their babies continue developing outside the egg with milk, like other mammals, and they are warm-blooded, but their average body temperature is much lower than marsupials and placental mammals. Plus, the platypus is capable of delivering a venomous sting, which is very unusual for warm-blooded animals, but fairly common in cold-blooded animals like reptiles. In the Jurassic, these types of more primitive egg-laying mammals were considerably more common. Monotremes today are only known from Australia and New Guinea, but millions of years ago they had a much larger range. The fossil of an ancient platypus relative, known as Monotrematum, was discovered in Argentina and is dated to around 61 million years ago, just after the dinosaurs had gone extinct. 160 million years ago, all of the southern continents used to be connected in one supercontinent called Gondwana, and it is believed that monotremes were widely distributed across this ancient continent, and Monotrematum was a descendant of a lineage of them that survived in South America after this giant continent had started to break up. In the last 10 million years or so, the continents started to take their current form. Africa and South America rejoined with the northern continents, and Antarctica moved southward, becoming incredibly cold. These changes saw the extinction of a lot of their native species. However, monotremes were able to cling on in Australia and neighboring islands like New Guinea and Tasmania because these landmasses remained isolated. But this is only half of the story because monotremes only make up a handful of species in Australia, and the continent is actually dominated by marsupials. Although marsupials are best known from Australia today, they would have also had a big range spreading throughout the southern continents like monotremes. This can be seen because very old fossils of marsupial have been found in Antarctica's Seymour Island dating to around 45 million years ago, probably before it became freezing and almost uninhabitable and there are dozens of small marsupial species in South America to this day, like Monito del Monte, or the big-eared possum. It is actually thought that marsupials originated in the Americas and migrated to Australia, traveling across Antarctica to get there when the continents were much closer to each other. However, monotremes have been in Australia considerably longer than this, and may have even originated there, and not only survived the migration of marsupials, but continued evolving and thriving because there was once a giant species of platypus that lived alongside marsupials. A close platypus relative known as Obdurodon lived in Australia until about 5 million years ago and was about 2.5 times as long as a platypus and may have weighed as much as a spaniel. It was very similar to the living platypus, only it had harder teeth, and because of this it is thought to have eaten harder and larger prey. So how did the platypus and echidna survive and thrive when Australia was invaded by marsupials? Well, it is thought that it had something to do with their unique lifestyle and way of hunting for food. One of the oldest known monotremes was called Sterepodon, that dated back to mid-Cretaceous Australia about 110 million years ago. This creature is only known from a singular fragment of a jawbone, so what the creature looked like is unknown. However, the jaw has a large groove running through it, and modern day platypus have this as well, to allow a large blood vessel and nerve to attach to their bill. So seeing this on Strepidon strongly suggests that they also had a bill, and so may have looked very similar to a platypus. Platypus have a bill because it allows them to find food in an incredibly unique way. 
The bill is covered in electroreceptors that can pick up the electrical signals in their prey, similar to sharks. The prey that platypus hunt, like worms and crayfish, often hide under the lake bed where they cannot be seen or smell, but their electricity can still be detected. The flat surface of the bill means the electroreceptors are spread out along a large surface area, which means the platypus can accurately work out the direction of the electrical signal, and therefore the location of their prey. This means that the fact their bill looks like a duck beak is just a coincidence, because the function is completely different. So their existence is not evidence of convergent evolution with ducks at all, and actually shows convergent evolution with rays and sharks. Animals that are able to use electroreception are nearly always aquatic, because water conducts electricity much better. So this method of hunting doesn't work very well on land. So if Storepidon also had a bill, it was probably also semi-aquatic and lived in a very similar way to Platypus. When Storepidon was at large, Australia was much closer to the South Pole, and would have been much wetter and cooler than today. It was probably heavily forested, and there is even some evidence of sea ice forming on the southern coast in the winter, so this animal had to survive in a very different environment to modern day Australia. Storepidon would have shared a habitat with the large Australian dinosaurs like Mataburosaurus, and may have had to avoid the giant predatory amphibian Coolosuchus that it may have shared its rivers and lakes with. Storepidon was around the same size as a modern day platypus, which would have meant that it was one of the largest mammals to live alongside the dinosaurs. But there was another Cretaceous platypus relative called Tynolophus that was tiny, being around the fifth of the size, and was probably even older than Storepidon. Platypus are also nocturnal, and their electroreception abilities are extremely helpful for them to effectively hunt at night, and this may have been even more useful for the ancient platypus relatives like Storepidon and Tynolophus, because in the Cretaceous their habitat would have been in the Antarctic Circle, so would have been in complete darkness for some amount of the year. It is thought that platypus and echidnas lived on after the marsupial invasion of Australia because of their ancestors' adaptation to the water. Although platypus are amphibious creatures, echidnas are land dwellers. All of the earliest monotremes like Tynolophus, Storepidon, and even Monotrematum seem to have looked like platypuses, but the earliest echidna looking animals do not turn up in the fossil record until around 15 million years ago, but genetic evidence suggests that they may have diverged from platypus as little as 30 million years ago. This means that it is likely that echidnas descended from platypus looking aquatic relatives, and this actually makes a lot of sense because although echidnas are very different to platypuses in a lot of ways, there are some notable similarities. Echidnas also seem to have some electroreception abilities, only they do not really use them very much. So if they were descendants of platypus-like animals, these could be explained as vestigial leftovers from their ancestry. Amphibious marsupials are very rare in comparison with other types of mammals, and this is probably most likely because of their reproduction cycle. Because their young are born very premature and have to live in a pouch for the first stage of their life, they are at risk of drowning if the mother was to enter the water. One species of marsupial, known as the water opossum, has a strong ring of muscle lining their pouch they can seal when they enter the water, so aquatic marsupials are possible, but because of these reasons they seem to find it much harder to adapt to the water, and no marsupials are as adapted to an aquatic lifestyle as much as the platypus is. Because monotremes lay eggs, they do not need to worry about this issue, and so could colonize habitats where the marsupials could not follow. For a long time, many people may have seen the platypus as inferior from another time period and was just treading water on the brink of being outcompeted by the superior marsupials. But in the safety of their watery ecosystems, the features that got them maligned as primitive animals actually may have helped them survive into the present day. Thank you for watching. A big thanks to my patrons for supporting the channel, especially the big contributors like Night Runner, Sammy Voz, Brandon Klopp, Green Falls, Crazy Cody, Grim Marshall, and Ken Ham. If you enjoy content like this, then consider becoming a patron as well.